good evening everybody and welcome to today's caravan special lecture journeys to freedom 1941 to 1947 and to deliver this lecture we have a very special guest professor sugata bose joining us from calcutta he is currently serving as a gardener professor of oceanic history and affairs at harvard university the united states of america professor bose's field of specialization is modern south asian and indian oceanic history he obtained his phd from the university of cambridge his book in his books include his majesty's opponent subhash chandra bose and india struggle against empire which was published by the harvard university press in 2011 and i think it is one of the must reads of indian history and everybody should read it and i think it's right now available on amazon please do check it out and 100 horizons the indian ocean in the age of global empires and it was also published by the uh, harvard university press in 2006 In a hundred horizons, Professor Bose crosses area studies and disciplinary frontiers as he bridges the domains of political economy and culture. He was a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship in 1997. Professor Bose is currently writing a book titled "Asia After Europe: Decline and Rise of the Continent," and that is under contract with Harvard University Press. And he is working as general editor of the Cambridge History of Indian Ocean. From 20, 2014 to 2019, Professor Sugata Bose has served as a member of India's Parliament from the Jadhavpur constituency, West Bengal, and he is the, also the director of the Netaji Research Bureau in Calcutta, India, a research center and archives devoted to the life and work of Professor Bose's great uncle, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, the great Indian patriot. So, without further ado, I am really happy to invite. I am really happy to welcome Professor Bose this evening. It's such an honor to host Professor Bose this evening. So, over to you, sir, and thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ishan. Uh, it's wonderful to uh, speak to this uh, heritage uh, exploration group. I uh, thought, uh, having seen the name of your group. that i might as well uh, speak about heritage and in particular uh, two journeys to freedom uh, one in 1941 the other in 1943 uh, which uh, led uh, to the winning of uh, our independence in 1947 uh, i thought i'd also give a personal touch uh, to uh what uh i will say to you today uh to give you uh, some idea of you know how i met uh people uh who had struggled for india's uh, freedom as i was growing up the first journey is one that i heard about uh, from my father uh, shishir kumar bose uh in 1940 uh, shubhash chandra bose uh, was in prison so he went on hunger strike in presidency jail saying to the british release me or i shall refuse to live and so the british did not want him to die on their hands uh, the viceroy linlithgow and uh, the bengal governor uh, herbert Uh, decided that they would play what they called a cat and mouse policy with him so they would release him uh, let him go home keep him under very close police and intelligence surveillance and as soon as he recovered uh, his health uh, he would be rearrested but of course uh, shubhash chandra bose uh, had other ideas so on the day that he was brought uh, to his uh, elgin road home that was the 5th of december 1940 he called his nephew uh, my later my father shishir bose uh, and clasped his hand for a very long time but he didn't say anything to him that day a few days later after the stream of visitors had waned a little bit he sent word to my father that uh, he should come across in those days there were two historic bose houses one was 38 by 2 elgin road um which had been built by janakinath bose my 
great grandfather, uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose's father in 1909-1910, uh, which now uh, is called Netaji Bhavan, and the Netaji Research Bureau is based there. And there was another house which uh, Sharath Chandra Bose, uh, my grandfather, had built in 1927. Now, Shubhash used to live in One Woodman Park, but from 1937, at the request of his mother, he had started living in Elgin Road in what used to be his father's bedroom. So on receiving his uh, uncle's summons, uh, Shishi walked across from the one Woodburn Park house to 38 by two Elgin Road. Uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose asked him to sit on his bed on his right, uh, looked at him uh, and asked a famous question. Can you do some work for me? And that was to help uh, plan and execute his uh, escape from India. So from that day onwards, every evening, my father would come and discuss uh, with his uncle. And they had to make what Shubhash Chandra Bose described as a foolproof plan of escape. Uh, from the house. In the course of these uh, confabulations, uh, one day, uh, Mia Akbar Shah came from the Northwest Frontier Province. Uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose introduced him to my father, Shishir, and together the two of them went to Wachel Mulla's shop in central Calcutta to make some purchases for Netaji's disguise as Muhammad uh, Ziauddin. After that, uh, Akbar Shah was dropped off at the Howrah railway station to go back uh, to the frontier. On Christmas day, uh, my father was uh, asked to take an endurance test. Uh, he drove uh, the car which you see behind me, the Wanderer, it's a 1937 car. Uh, he went up to Bodhoman railway station, had lunch there, and turned around and came back to Calcutta. In fact, uh, uh, Sharath Chandra Bose uh, had two cars at that time. One was registered in the name of his wife, my grandmother, Bibhabhuti Bose. That was a Studebaker president. And the other was uh, registered in the name of my father, uh, because he was very fond of cars. This was the Wanderer. Uh, which be belongs to the Audi uh, family of, uh, uh, of, of cars. Um, and um, so finally, on the night of uh, the 16th, 17th January at 1.30 a.m., uh, my father and Shubhash Chandra Bose uh, drove uh, out of this house at 38 by 2 Elgin Road it was about 1.35 a.m. at night. And my father drove uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose in this wanderer car the whole night um, until in the morning they reached a place called Barari near Dhanbad. Now, during the journey, um, uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose gave coffee to my father, the driver, from a thermos flask. Uh, they discussed, among other things, Imon de Valera's great escape from Lincoln Jail. Um, but despite being in disguise, Shubhash Chandra Bose could not really come out during the day. And so uh, he was kept hidden uh, in Barari in Dhanbad. And after night fell, uh, he was uh, driven uh, up to Gomo Station, Gomo Railway Junction, which was at that time in Bihar. Now it is in Jharkhand. And my father has described how uh, he saw uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose walking uh, across the overbridge with his majestic gait. And then the Delhi Kalka mail came in from uh, Calcutta, from Howrah. And my father waited uh, until the train rumbled out of the station and uh, he could see a garland of lights uh, going away further and further uh, following the rhythm of the clatter 
uh, of the train's wheels. Now from uh, Gomo uh, up to Peshawar, Shubhash Chandra Bose was by himself. As Muhammad Ziauddin, my father had printed a visiting card for him, uh, you know, saying that he was uh, an, uh, working for an insurance company uh, with a false address in the Jabalpur civil lines. Uh, in Delhi, he had to change uh, to the Frontier Mail, uh, which took him to Peshawar. And on 19th January uh, evening, as the Frontier Mail arrived in Peshawar, Mia Akbar Shah, who had visited Calcutta, uh, was present and uh, received him at the uh, Peshawar uh, cantonment station. And uh, he was the one uh, who organized uh, Netaji's uh, uh, journey from Peshawar to Kabul. And in fact, it was on 26th January, which is now Republic Day, but which in those days before independence was celebrated as Independence Day, because the independence pledge had been take taken by the banks of the river Ravi uh, on 26th January 1930. It was on that day that uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose crossed uh, the territorial limits of British India into the tribal territories and eventually reached uh, Kabul on the 31st of March of, uh, uh, not 31st of March, 31st of January of uh, uh, 1941. So that was the first phase of the escape. And this was what really uh, was the beginning of the transformation of uh, Rabindranath Tagore's Deshanayak Shubhash Chandra Bose to Netaji, uh, which was the, with the title given to him by his followers uh, in uh, Europe uh, in 1941. Now, uh, from uh, Kabul via Moscow to Berlin, uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose traveled under a different name, Orlando Matsota, that of an Italian diplomat. This was a period when the German-Soviet pact was still in place, but then after the German invasion of the Soviet Union, uh, it was not really possible uh, for Shubhash Chandra Bose to execute his plan of an armed thrust from the Northwest uh, into uh, uh, India. And therefore, he was thinking of uh, moving to Asia, and that uh, plan uh, became uh, even more urgent once Japan entered the war in December 1941. Singapore fell uh, on the 15th of February of 1942, and by March of 1942, the uh, Japanese were at the gates of, uh, of India. But it took some time for uh, this uh, 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 for this uh, plan uh, to be, you know, put into action. And I will now tell you about the second journey, uh, the submarine voyage, but I'll also share with you how I got to hear firsthand about this journey to freedom. Now, 51 years ago, in January of 1970, uh, I was 13 years old, and I was told that uh, Netaji's sole Indian companion on his perilous 90-day submarine voyage from Europe to Asia in 1943 was coming to stay with us. We happily vacated the children's room, as we were duty-bound to do, whenever Netaji's close associates visited Calcutta. This room on the ground floor of One Woodburn Park was better known as Nehru's room because that was where Jawaharlal stayed as my grandfather, Sharath Chandra Bose's guest during his visits to Calcutta during the freedom struggle. We were very familiar with uh, Abid Hassan's photographs with his leader on the deck of the German submarine and their transfer together in mid-ocean on a rubber boat to the Japanese submarine. They were prominently displayed at the museum in Netaji Bhavan, 38 by 2 Elgin Road. His hair had grayed, 
but it was easy to recognize Netaji's comrade in arms when he arrived at our home with a smile on his lips and a twinkle in his eyes, and in an instant endeared himself to us. My father, Shishir Kumar Bose, who had driven Netaji during his Mahanishkraman or the Great Escape from Calcutta in January 1941, which I have just described to you, had invited Abid Hassan on behalf of the Netaji Research Bureau to deliver the Netaji oration on 23rd January 1970. He had started this Netaji birth anniversary tradition in January 1961, when S.A. Iyer, the Minister of Publicity in the Azad Hind government, had given the first Netaji oration. These January orations were initially designed to record for posterity first-hand memoirs of those who had fought alongside Netaji for India's freedom. S.A. Iyer had been followed among Netaji's close associates by M.R. Vyas, who had been with him in Europe. He came in 1962. Hari Vishnu Kamath, a close associate of Netaji in the late 1930s in India, spoke in 1963. Then came Lakshmi Saigal, the commander of the Rani of Jhasi Regiment of the INA in 1964. Girija Mukherjee, who was again with Netaji in Europe, gave a very major Netaji oration in 1965. Prem Kumar Saigal, uh, one of the Red Fort Three, uh, a senior INA officer, spoke in 1966. And Alexander Werth uh, of Germany, uh, who had helped uh, the Indian Legion that Netaji established in Europe, had been the featured speaker in 1969. Now, this is not to mention the visits of Jawaharlal Nehru in 1961, the year the Netaji Museum was established by my father, Shishir Kumar Bose, Jaya Prakash Narayan in 1962. Dilip Kumar Roy in 1963, and the concert that he gave was recorded and we were able to release those songs this 23rd January for the public. And Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, whom I clearly remember, uh, visited uh, in December of 1969. As soon as Abid Hassan retired from the Indian Foreign Service, uh, my father, Shishir Kumar Bose, made certain that he would be brought to Calcutta in January of 1970. Uncle Abid's room, which we vacated for him, had a door leading to the beautiful curved southern veranda of One Woodburn Park. That is where we gathered around him as he sat on a cane chair, looking at the eucalyptus tree in the distance to hear him narrate his adventures with Netaji in Europe the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, and Asia. The devotion and loyalty that Netaji elicited from his followers had to be seen to be believed. As with most other men and women of the INA I have met, Uncle Abid wept profusely as he remembered his leader. I still remember trying to record an interview with Mahabub Ahmad, who had been Netaji's military secretary in 1945. Uh, this was in Patna in 1991. And each time I would roll the camera, Mahabu Bahamad would break down. And finally, he told me that, uh, look, decades have passed, but you know, I'm overcome with emotion when I speak about Netaji. And he told me that for a few months, uh, uh, you know, uh, he had had the privilege of working with Mahatma Gandhi before his assassination in January of 1948, since he too, like Uncle Abid, had joined the Indian Foreign Service, he had worked with Jawaharlal Nehru. But then he told me that there was only one leader that I was prepared to die for, and that was Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. Now, Abid Hassan had not yet written his oration when he arrived in Calcutta in January 1970. He was provided with a desk and chair along with my mother, Krishna Bose's Olivetti typewriter in one corner of the veranda. My mother was pleased to find someone who beat her 
in the art of slow typing. After composing a passage, Uncle Abid would give us a shout and we would rush to hear what he had written. After reading a few sentences, his voice would choke with emotion. He became concerned that he would not be able to deliver the oration before the public. How embarrassing it would be if I break down like this, he kept saying. My mother tried to boost his morale with a steady supply of good food and music. He enjoyed Bengali cuisine, supplemented by a bowl of green chilies placed before him. I watched him sitting at the oval marble table in our dining room with beads of sweat appearing on his forehead as he munched the chilies and tears flowed down his cheeks. After a hard day's work, Uncle Abid would say to my mother in the evening, Krishnaji, now please sing. My mother had an exquisite singing voice. Uncle Abid wanted to hear two favorites. The first was Rabindranath Tagore's Tomai Shajabo Jatone Kushuma Ratone Keure Kankane Kumkume Chandane. I will adorn you lovingly with flowers and jewels, perfumes and bangles, red powder and sandal paste. The other was a song composed by Mohini Choudhury and set to music by Shoilesh Dattagupta. Tomai ami bhulbo nago, tomar katha roi be mone, nai baholo milano moder eiji bane. I will not forget you, you will be remembered. No matter our union eluded us in this life. Having sung the same song, the two songs, seven days in a row, my mother asked Uncle Abid whether they held any special significance for him. He just liked the first song. Tagore had beautifully expressed man's eternal love for woman. But yes, there was a particular reason behind his fondness for the second song, he said, looking wistful as he hummed its first line. Observing the serious expression on his face, my mother could not bring herself to ask who he would not forget, a lost love or his lost leader. Having heard the refrain, I will not forget, from so many of Netaji's followers, she concluded that the balance of probability lay with the latter. Despite his deep devotion to his leader, the song may have evoked memories of the woman Uncle Abid had courted in wartime Berlin and who might have occasionally come to visit him in post-war Switzerland. On the morning of 23rd January 1970 at Netaji Bhavan, Abid Hassan delivered his beautifully crafted and deeply moving Netaji oration titled The Men from Imphal in a somewhat monotonous voice, struggling not to be overcome by emotion. He had chosen to foreground in his oration the harrowing retreat of the brave soldiers of freedom after their march towards Delhi had been halted at Imphal. In one brilliant paragraph, he portrayed the character of the army of liberation to which he belonged. What a group we were, and ours was but a unit among many of its kind in our army. I felt proud, and I feel more proud today that I belong to it. Baluchis were there among us, and Assamese, Kashmiris and Malayalis, Pathans and Sikhs and Gujaratis, proud members of classes called the martial, and those till then denied reputation for martial valor, but who proved in battle that they could by their deeds claim equal honor. Every region in India was represented and every religion and every caste mixed inseparably together, not only in bigger formations, but even in small platoons and sections, each unit being a living tribute to the unity of India. We had our different private faiths and we had our different languages, but in our purpose and in our political belief, we were a well-knit, determined and indivisible whole. And once they reached Mandalay, Netaji came to meet them. The Sikhs oiled their beards, the Punjabi Muslims, the Dogras and Rajputs twirled their mustaches, and we the indiscriminates, Abid Hassan said, put on as good a face 
as we could manage. As Netaji spoke to them, their weariness seemed to depart and they felt refreshing new blood circulating in their veins. Abid Hassan understood the essence of his leadership. He was all we had, our leader, to whom each one of us, however humble, meant something, and who to us all meant everything. Our leader, to whom each one of us, however humble, meant something, and who to us all meant everything. He belonged to us, to us all of the Azad Hind movement, and entirely without any compromise. Abid Hassan then flashed back to October 1943 to illustrate the meaning of without any compromise by telling the story of Netaji's visit to the Chetia temple in Singapore. He had turned away the head priest saying, what, come to your temple where even Hindus of other castes are not permitted entry, not to speak of members of other communities who are equally near and dear to me. He agreed to go when the high priest returned with an invitation to an Indian national demonstration. When we came to the temple, Abid Hassan remembered, I found it filled to capacity with the uniforms of the INA officers and men and the black caps of South Indian Muslims glaringly evident. The memory I retain, he said, is one of an invigorating music as that of a symphony dedicated to the unity of the motherland. That music sustained him during his travails on the battlefield. Not all of the anecdotes he narrated to us in the southern veranda of One Woodburn Park, especially details of the submarine voyage and daily life with Netaji in Singapore and Rangoon could find place in Abid Hassan's Netaji oration. We urged him to write his memoirs, otherwise precious vignettes of our history would be lost to future generations such as yours. Krishnaji, why are you so impatient? He asked my mother. He was now going to lead a retired life and set up a farm and orchard in Southern India. We were going to visit his farm and he would record his life's experiences at leisure. By the time he returned to Calcutta a few years later, our Woodburn Park home had been acquired by the government. My father had hastily bought a two-storied house at 90 Sharat Post Road, which was in a rather dilapidated condition. My mother named it Boshundhara and set about restoring it and making it a center of academic, cultural, and political activity as Woodburn Park had been. On 10th March, 1976, Abid Hassan came to dinner at Boshundhara. Placing a basket full of grapes from Hyderabad in front of my mother, he stood with bowed head. He confessed his history had not been written. He had failed to keep his word. He knew he deserved punishment for his failure and so had brought this Nasrana. My mother's diary records a very nice garden party on the evening of 12th March, at which Abid Hassan and M.R. Vyas were present, along with some 25 guests. A colorful Darbari Shamiana was put up, Krishna Bose writes, my Togor tree and Raktokorobi were in bloom. On the morning of 13th March, Abid Hassan shifted from his hotel and came to stay with us. We were determined to record his memoirs on this occasion. We were ready with pen and paper, and more importantly, my father's tape recorder. My mother hung a photograph of Netaji addressing the Greater East Asia Conference in November 1943 in Tokyo on the wall of his guest suite. We had seen Abid Hassan in film footage of the conference arranging Netaji's papers. Surely the picture would inspire him to recount his experiences of those days. But Uncle Abid said he had starved at the expensive hotel and wanted to be fed first. He ate with great relish two large pabda fish that were served for him at lunch. He had once said to Netaji, he told us, that it was impossible to identify him as a Bengali, excepting 
when he ate fish. The extended interview with Abid Hassan that formed the basis of Krishna Bose's long form article, Shoiniker Sriti, was conducted day and night between 13th March and 15th March, 1976. Uncle Abid was a diffident public speaker, but a very engaging conversationalist. Puffing an endless chain of cigarettes, he transported us on those days and nights to the military camps of the Indian Legion in Germany, the rehearsal of the national greeting Jai Hind with Netaji, the drama and discipline of the submarine voyage, the tumultuous public events and the intimate private moments with Netaji during the Azad Hind movement in Southeast Asia and the saga in Imphal. Netaji had asked his followers in Europe to help him find a common national greeting that would have a nice ring to it and be acceptable to all religious communities. One day Abid Hassan heard some Rajput soldiers greet each other with Jai Ram Jiki. It seemed to have a musical quality and Hassan changed it to Jai Hindustan Ki. That did not quite work, but the abbreviated form Jai Hind sounded perfect and Netaji and his aides, including Abid Hassan rehearsed it continuously saying Jai Hind, Jai Hind to one another. And then Netaji enthusiastically embraced it as India's national greeting and it spread like wildfire. Always conscious of the need to foster unity among religious communities, Netaji had toyed with the idea of taking a Hindu, a Muslim and a Sikh on his journey to Asia. Once the German naval authorities told him that he could take only one aid, he picked Abid Hassan to be his companion. N.G. Swami and four others with advanced training in wireless telegraphy, secret inks, and sophisticated radio transmitters were to follow on a blockade runner in March. Abid Hassan was simply told to pack his bags for a long journey without any inkling of his destination. He thought that he might be sent to Mecca as part of a scheme to find anti-colonial recruits during the Hajj. It was only when he met Netaji at Lertra Bahnhof that he realized that he would be accompanying his leader. On the train from Berlin to Kiel, Netaji asked Abid Hassan, now do you know where you're going? Yes, Hassan replied, I know where we are going. Where are we going? Netaji inquired. We are both going to perform Hajj, Abid Hassan commented wryly, eliciting from his leader peals of laughter. He had truly become Netaji's only companion on a pilgrimage to freedom. During the submarine voyage, Netaji dictated a speech to Abid Hassan that he would deliver to women of the Rani of Chasi regiment. Once during a quiet moment up on the bridge of the German submarine, Abid Hassan had asked Netaji to name the worst fate he might suffer. Netaji had answered promptly to be in exile. This, as he prepared to mobilize Indian expatriates and proclaim a government in exile in Southeast Asia for a great patriotic war. Upon their transfer from the German to the Japanese submarine, both Netaji and Abid Hassan had felt something akin to a homecoming. Now, uh, there was a lot of military action during this uh, journey. Once the uh, uh, submarine, the German one, had been rammed by a British ship and had uh, tilted uh, to one side, and, but it had dived just in time. And while all of this was going on, Netaji was dictating uh, a speech to Abid Hassan, uh, completely unflappable. And the German captain, Musenberg, told the German crew to follow the example of the Indian leader and his secretary whenever they faced a crisis of that kind. In the evening on March 14th, 1976, Uncle Abid wanted a break from being interviewed and announced his intention to go shopping for Bengal's Tangail saris with my mother. By the time she got ready, he had changed his mind 
and wanted to buy a golden retriever puppy instead, having seen an advertisement in the newspaper. Now, those puppies could not be got that evening, but later on, we were able to get a golden retriever puppy for Uncle Abid. Krishna Bose's diary contains an important entry on 14th March, 1976, regarding the tape recording session throughout the day. Abid Hassan says, she notes, on 17th August, 1945, in Saigon, he would have accompanied Netaji. And Netaji himself wished so. But because of military protocol, Colonel Habibur Rahman was asked to go. He was senior. Anyway, all of them were to follow him shortly, so they did not realize that it would become a matter of such importance at the moment. Now, Habibur Rahman later recorded that as Netaji was lying wounded on his deathbed in Taipei, uh, he called Hassan, Hassan. And Habibur Rahman said to him, Hassan yaha nahi hai saab, main hu Habib. Uh, so, uh, you know, clearly uh, here was a man who was very close to Netaji uh, for whom he had called uh, in the final hours of his life. On March 15th, 1976 morning, Pandit Ravi Shankar came to see the Netaji Museum and we all came to Netaji Bhavan to show him round. As with most visitors, he was deeply moved to see documentary film footage of Netaji. On 23rd January that year, he had presented a wonderful Netaji birthday concert for Netaji Research Bureau, performing the ragas Shyamakalyan, Charukeshi, and Maj Khambaj on the occasion of the second international Netaji seminar. The first had been organized by my father in 1973, and the second one had featured Dilip Kumar Roy, Netaji's friend, Teruo Hachia, who was Japan's uh, ambassador to the Azad Hind government, Prem Kumar Saigal and Gurbak Singh Dhilan of Red Fort Trial fame. My parents and I had resumed our tape recording session with Uncle Abid at home in the afternoon when news came that my BA part one results had come out. I was a student like many of you at that stage. After the marathon interview was done, it was time to indulge Uncle Abid. Hassan Saab and myself went to Bongo Street, my mother has recorded, and bought four saris. They then went and visited my mother's parents. At about 4.30 a.m. in the morning, says the entry for March 16th, 1976, of my mother's reliable diary, Abid Hassan left for Hyderabad. He remonstrated with my mother as she appeared at that unearthly hour with a cup of tea, followed by us. You too, he said, looking at us. Well, I am your driver, I told him. How else will you get to the airport? Uncle Abid, my father, my sister and I got into our black Studebaker champion and I set off for the airport. My mother remained at home with my brother Shumantra. She waved from the balcony upstairs and heard Jai Hind, Jai Hind in the darkness as Uncle Abid said his goodbyes to the staff. It was good to have Abid Hassan with us for a few days, she noted. It was a welcome destruction from our material worries. I left for Cambridge in September 1978 and was not always present during Uncle Abid's subsequent visits to Calcutta. It was during one of these visits that my mother and he settled on the conclusion to Shoiniker Sriti, a soldier remembers. Uncle Abid interrupted a discourse on flowers to tell my mother that he had suffered his usual fate with Netaji at their final meeting in Saigon airport on 17th August, 1945. He had received a scold for arriving late with the luggage. My mother responded with the Bengali saying, Shashon kara tari shaje, shohag kare jego. It is only the one who showers affection who is entitled to issue a rebuke. Uncle Abid laughed and replied, 
I don't know about that. That is your interpretation. Uncle Abid remained a pillar of support for my father as he struggled against tremendous odds to preserve and disseminate the finest lessons of our freedom movement. On receiving the Netaji Research Bureau's new journal, The Oracle, Abid Hassan wrote from Golconda, Hyderabad on 8th December, 1979. My dear Shishir, thank you ever so much for sending me a copy of The Oracle. You have brought it out very well indeed, much better than I expected. But then you are always so thorough and painstaking, attending to all minute details, just like your uncle. And it is the, this drudgery of attending to details that pays dividends in the end. I know so many people envy you when success is achieved, but of course they are not there to help you with a hand at the wheel, pulling the cart out, of, out when it is stuck in the mire. How many years, day in and day out, have you been attending to the Netaji seminar? It is thanks mainly to your efforts that it has now turned out to be a veritable scholarly research institute. My heartiest congratulations to you with kindest regards, yours, Abid Hassan. My last meeting with Uncle Abid took place in 1983. I was by that time a fellow of St. Catherine's College at the University of Cambridge. After several poverty-stricken years as a student, I had something of an income and decided to treat my father and Uncle Abid to a sumptuous dinner at Sallu's in Knightsbridge, London. I think Abid Hassan enjoyed the European wine even more than the South Asian food. Uncle Abid, my father, and I, some of us had gathered around them. We talked late into the evening about Gandhi and Jinnah, independence and partition, and of course, the grand vision of subcontinental unity presented by Netaji Shubhashtandra Bose. When I dropped him off at his hotel in our little mustard colored Datsun car before driving back to Cambridge at midnight, I could not have imagined that he would leave us the following year. We never forgot him, but India's younger generation need to be taught about the forgotten vestiges of our freedom struggle faced with the threat of unequal citizenship from the forces of religious majoritarianism, Krishna Bose wrote her last article published on 1st February 2020 on the values represented by Abid Hassan before her own passing three weeks later on 22nd February 2020. And we at the Netaji Research Bureau decided that we would posthumously offer Abid Hassan the Netaji Award this 23rd January, and it was accepted from Hyderabad by his niece, Professor Ismat Mehdi. He was a quiet revolutionary, Abid Hassan was, who kept himself out of the limelight, even while being present at every vital scene and moment of the final phase of our freedom struggle across Europe and Asia. He served his country with distinction after independence in China, West Asia, Africa, and Europe. 51 years ago, Abid Hassan had in his Netaji oration referred to these frustrating times when India again seems to be a house divided against itself. The times have turned even more ominous now and inhuman acts that Abid Hassan deplored are becoming an everyday reality in today's India. His oration was, in Shishir Kumar Bose's words, a moving affirmation of the revolutionary faith given to us by our leader. Abid Hassan had closed his oration with a message of hope. The people of India will accept any leadership provided the call remains the same and the call cannot be, but forget not that the grossest crime is to compromise with injustice and wrong. This was a line from Shubhashtandar Bose's letter to the government before going on his hunger strike in 1940. Forget not that the grossest crime is to compromise with injustice and wrong. 
As he was about to proclaim the formation of the Azad Hind government, Netaji asked Abid Hassan to get the national anthem that he had chosen, Tagore's Janogano Mono, rendered in Hindustani so that soldiers of the Azad Hind Forge could appreciate the meaning of Tagore's song. In Singapore, Abid Hassan got the lyricist Mumtaz Hussain, composed the Hindustani song in three verses rather than five of the original, and Ram Singh Thakur wrote down a band score based on the original tune. Mumtaz Hussain did not attempt a translation, but sought to capture the spirit of Tagore's song. Jaya He naturally became Jaya Ho long before A.R. Rahman made Jaya Ho famous the world over. The first verse that mentioned several place names bore a strong resemblance to the Bengali lyric. A comparison of the second verse evoking unity, not part of today's national anthem, gives a clear sense of the connection between the Bengali original and the Hindustani version. Tagore's lines were these. Aharaha tabo avhan pracharito shuni tabo udar bani Hindu bodha shikh jaina para shikh musalaman krishtani Purab pashchimashe Tabo shingha shana paashe Re mohar hai gatha The Azad Hind version went thus Sab ke dil me preet basaye Teri meethi vani Har subhe ke rehne wale Har mazahab ke prani Sab bhed aur farak mita ke Sab god me teri aake Gunthe prem ki mala Can India defeat today's divisive policies and bind its diverse people together once again as Netaji had done with a garland of love. As for our national greeting that Netaji gave us, the inspiration that he gave to the Azad in Forge must be rekindled today by India's younger generation. Jai Hind. Thank you very much, sir, for this very beautiful session and the beautiful rendition of the National Anthem of the INA. And it was truly an honor to host you. And I think I'm, I'm still in that phase after, you know, listening to you, I'm still in that phase. And it was very beautiful. And thank you so much for that. Uh, we have some questions. And firstly, I have a question to you. And uh, the, uh, the question is, there are several conspiracy theories surrounding Netaji's death, and you have also written about that. In His Majesty's opponent, you have given an account of Netaji's untimely death in a plane crash, mm -hmm. but many still refuse to believe it. And Netaji's death remains a controversial, as controversial as ever. What do you have to say as a historian and as a family member of Netaji Bose? You know, uh, first of all, I never speak about Netaji as a family member. And that's because uh, Netaji always believed that his family and country were coterminous. Uh, also, you know, my father would often uh, relate a particular uh, 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 story to me. You know, he was in prison, uh, you know, in the Red Fort and then in solitary confinement in the Lahore Fort uh, and finally in Lalpur Jail, which is Faisalabad now. And he was released in September of 1945. And uh, in Lahore, he heard a new slogan, uh, Bose Khandan Zindabad. And when he came back uh, by train from uh, Lahore to Calcutta, uh, and everywhere there was this slogan, uh, his father, my grandfather, Sharath Chandra Bose, told him that don't let these kinds of slogans uh, turn your head. You've lost four years of your studies in medical college. Go back 
and uh, finish your studies, become a doctor, and then you can serve your country in whatever way you like. Um, but remember that uh, this is Shubhash's reflected glory. And my father always would tell me this uh, when I was uh, uh, growing up. But I do have uh, my, uh, uh, you know, role as a, as a historian. And I can understand that in the immediate decades after independence, there was a uh, mass psychological phenomenon in India. And people wanted Netaji to return and solve the country's problems. But, you know, um, when we are faced with all kinds of bogus conspiracy theories, uh, including, uh, you know, one or two uh, fabrications which are designed to denigrate him, uh, I think we need to face up uh, to the facts and accept the historical truth. And there is overwhelming evidence that tragically, uh, Netaji died on the 18th of August, 1945. In fact, he laid down his life. He was the only top ranking leader of the Indi in India's freedom struggle who um, sacrificed his life on the battlefield. And we need to honor his martyr's death. And I have faith in the younger generation of Indians that they will be mature enough to come to terms with what I've called the mortal end of a deathless hero. Uh, and, you know, there were uh, seven survivors of the crash. Uh, there were doctors, there was the nurses, uh, an, an interpreter who was brought, and of course, Habibur Rahman was there. Uh, so let us focus on his life and work because we still have a lot to learn from his book of life. That's true. And the second question relates to somewhat contemporary theme, and that is uh, Netaji has been politically appropriated by both left, right, and also center. And many claim uh, to the political legacy of Netaji Bose has been made and are, being, are often made in public. So how do you see that? And if, we can, if you can define what nationalism meant to Netaji personally? Yes, I think... Uh... You know, uh, the, the younger generation of Indians, students, uh, young people should actually uh, read Netaji's own writings. His collected works are available, published by the Netaji Research Bureau, uh, his own letters, his uh, books, uh, his essays, his uh, speeches, uh, in order to find out for themselves what Netaji stood for. You know, in the past, there had been some governmental neglect. But unfortunately, now there are rather crude and brazen attempts at official misappropriation. But Netaji cannot be so easily uh, misappropriated because his, you know, life was crystal clear. Uh, and uh, so we have to remember that Netaji was not just a warrior hero, even though he was you know, India's uh, foremost soldier statesman. He was also a philosopher. He was a thinker uh, who had some clear conceptions about the social and economic reconstruction of India after independence was won. And that's why it's so important to read his Haripura address in 1938 or those of his speeches and writings where he's talking about what kind of India he wishes to see. Now, as for nationalism, um, you know, he did not actually believe in uh, the contemporary uh, version of so-called muscular nationalism. He always condemned that form of nationalism that he saw as narrow and selfish and arrogant. He believed in a generous and imaginative conception of love for one's country. He wanted to see India as, a, as an independent federal republic. He was also somebody who believed in cultural intimacy among India's different religious communities. And uh, he believed in equal rights for everyone. And he certainly believed in equal citizenship. And that's why he was able to command the trust of Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Christians, you know, Punjabis, Tamils, Gujaratis, Bengalis, everyone. And that is something that Mahatma Gandhi recognized. And seven days before his own assassination, he said that, uh, you know, no other leader uh, has been able to 
uh, you know, elicit so much uh, affection and loyalty has, as Netaji has done. And so in the name of that great patriot, he asked Indians to you know, banish all communal bitterness from their hearts. So I'll come to the question of Netaji's relation with Gandhiji uh, in the later part of the uh, Q&A. And we have a question from Anirban and his question, and I'll add to that. Can you comment on how Netaji Bose's dream of an industrial future for free India varied with Mahatma Gandhi's Rama Rajya? And what would you describe what would you describe as Netaji's view on the socio-economic model of development for India? Yes, uh, here uh, uh, there, there was a difference with Gandhi and in fact, Shubhashtandra Bose may have been closer to Jawaharlal Nehru on this particular question. Um, uh, because, you know, Gandhiji believed in a, sort of an extreme kind of decentralization that, you know, he believed India lived in its villages uh, he had said so in Hind Swaraj, and he continued to hold more or less uh, uh, to that belief. While uh, Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose believed in a modern industrial future for India, and that is why as president of the Indian National Congress, he set up the National Planning Committee, and he asked uh, Jawaharlal Nehru to be its chairman. Uh, he worked very closely with the scientist Meghnath Shah. He wanted a partnership between science and politics, but he was also somebody who was very fair-minded. And that's why among the original nine members of the National Planning Committee, he included J.C. Kumarappa, who was a Gandhian purist, who actually believed in Gandhi's philosophy. And Shubhash Chandra Bose also said that, you know, having some, uh, you know, large modern industries does not mean that we are not going to have small cottage industries. Uh, so uh, he was prepared to, you know, have a conversation with the, with the Gandhians as well. Uh, and he was not necessarily just imposing uh, his uh, preference. Um, but if he was closer to Nehru in, in this respect, when it came to uh, uh, the, uh, unity and equality among all religious and linguistic communities, he was probably closer to Gandhi. Uh, and uh, Excepting that Gandhi changed with the times um, at a time when Shubhash Chandra Bose was talking about cultural intimacy in the 1920s, Gandhiji would not even dine with his closest political comrades, Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali. But that changed dramatically when he went to see the Ayana soldiers in the Red Fort and the Lahore Fort. They told Mahatma Gandhi that, you know, when we were fighting under Netaji's leadership in the Indian National Army, we had absolutely no differences or distinction. Um, and here the British are trying to serve us Hindu tea and Muslim tea. And Gandhiji said, why do you suffer it? And they replied, we don't. We mix what they give us as Hindu tea and Muslim tea uh, to, and uh, equally and then uh, serve, same with food. And Gandhi was very pleased. He smiled and said, you know, that is, uh, that is the spirit uh, in which you should deal with this uh, kind of uh, question. So yes, on that industry question, uh, there was a difference of perspective, uh, but in many other ways, uh, you know, they were, they were quite close together and particularly after 1942, after Gandhiji launched the Quit India movement, there were hardly any differences in the aims and ideology of Mahatma Gandhi and Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. Yes, and uh, the next question is from Harsh Vardhan Elluri and he asks that, Sir, Dr. Ambedkar stated that India got freedom because of Netaji and British left early due to the fear of Netaji. So can you please throw some light on this? Yes, um, you know, Mahatma Gandhi has to be credited with... Uh, can you still see me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, Gandhiji, uh, you know, uh, must be credited with bringing about a mass awakening in India uh, particularly during the first non-cooperation movement, 1919 to 1922. Uh, he changed nationalism, particularly the Congress, which was a club of uh, the educated elite into a mass political organization. But then, you know, uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose worked under Gandhiji's leadership for 20 years. And he saw that the civilian masses in India had all rallied to Mahatma Gandhi's call. But Indian soldiers were still loyal 
to the British King Emperor. So that's why he wanted to take advantage of the international war crisis. Uh, and he wanted access to these Indian soldiers. He wanted to change their loyalty to the British with a new loyalty to the cause of India's freedom. And in that, he succeeded quite dramatically uh, between 1943 and 1945. And that was recognized by Mahatma Gandhi himself. He said that a new spirit had arisen in the Indian soldier before. You know, he, they, had, they had been working like hired assassins ever since Jalian Wallabak. Uh, and so it's true that by uh, the end of 1945, early 1946, I would say certainly by February 1946, the British realized that they could not rely on the Indian element to hold India down by force anymore. In fact, they could not use Indian soldiers to defend and protect their British empire anymore. So yes, Netaji paved the way and speeded up the process, not only of India's independence, but also uh, of the independence of the rest of the colonized peoples of Asia. So uh, I'll ask a question that relates to Gandhiji now. And, and that was, uh, you know, what, how, how I was reading somewhere, you know, that there was some, uh, some, some, break in the relation of Bose and Gandhi in the backdrop of the Tripuri crisis. So can you can you tell that is it a political rivalry or is it just a myth? And also the relation of Bose and Nehru. And that is also quite a mythified version, I think, that that you know goes around on social media. So if you can talk about that. In 1939, there were certain differences. Uh, and it led to a very temporary parting of the ways between uh, Gandhiji and uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose. Uh, now, Shubhash Chandra Bose stood for re-election for a second time, and he defeated you know, Gandhi's favored candidate, Pat Patavisi Taramaya. And this was the first successful challenge to Gandhiji's political authority in the Congress since 1920. So Gandhiji was not especially pleased, and he said that uh, Pattabhi's defeat is my defeat. But Shubhash Chandra Bose did not accept that interpretation. He basically said that this um, you know, contest was not uh, with you, and that he actually said that it would be a tragedy for me if I gained the trust of all other Indians and fail to win the trust of India's greatest man. You know, he was saying that even in the aftermath of his uh, electoral uh, victory. Um, but, uh, you know, because there was a resolution that was passed at Tripuri by, uh, you know, brought by Govind Balla Pant, that, uh, that uh, the president uh, should uh, form the Congress Working Committee by consulting Gandhiji, and Gandhiji refused to suggest any names. There was a deadlock, and therefore, by the end of April, Shubhash Chandra Bose decided to resign as, as Congress president. So yes, in 1939, there were differences. And also, uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose felt at that time that Jawaharlal Nehru was riding two horses. He had hoped that Nehru would side with him, but he didn't sort of. Uh, uh, and so there, were, um, uh, there was some uh, tension. But, uh, you know, even after the war broke out in September, Shubhash Chandra Bose was invited by Gandhiji to Vardha. Uh, in 1940, they met again. And then just before the escape, which I talked to you about today, um, you know, on 23rd December 1940, Shubhash Chandra Bose wrote to Gandhi offering him unconditional support uh, in any movement that he may choose to launch. And on 29th December, Gandhiji wrote a very interesting letter, which was opened by the British censors, saying, you are irrepressible whether ill or well, do get well before going in for fireworks. Uh, but then, as I said, Gandhiji did in 1942 what Shubhash Chandra Bose was urging him to do in 1939. So after that, there were no differences between them. Shubhash Chandra Bose supported the Quit India movement. When Louis Fisher came to see uh, Mahatma Gandhi in Sevagram in June 1942, Gandhiji described Shubhash Chandra Bose as a patriot of patriots. In fact, Khushed Ben, Dadabhai Nauroji's granddaughter, who was looking after Louis Fisher, actually told him that if Shubhash if Shubhash Chandra Bose came at the head of an Indian national army, then he would carry everything before him 
that Shubhash Chandra Bose was more popular than Nehru, and that in certain circumstances, he might even have a stronger appeal than Gandhiji. Uh, so he, this is what a devoted follower of Gandhiji was saying uh, at his ashram. And Shubhash Chandra Bose returned the compliment. I mean, he was the first to address Gandhiji as father of our nation. The father of our nation in this holy war for India's liberation, we ask for your blessings and good wishes, he said from Rangoon uh, Radio. Uh, in fact, in the first division, I mean, he named three brigades of the first division of the INA after Gandhi, Nehru, and Azad. And it was the Gandhi Brigade which fought heroically in Imphal. And in fact, Abid Hassan, whom, whom I was uh, talking about, uh, fought as a member of the Gandhi Brigade of the, of the INA. And before joining Netaji, he had spent time in Sabarmati Ashram. So, so there are many, many connections. And since I talked about 38 by 2 Elgin Road, Netaji Bhavan, you know, one photograph that you see as soon as you go up the main stairs of Netaji Bhavan before you go to Netaji's bedroom um, is a photograph of Mahatma Gandhi visiting Netaji's bedroom, paying homage to his rebellious son. Uh, in December 1945. So that was the kind of relationship that the two had. And I have read all of Gandhiji's works from 45 to 48, and every reference to Netaji is in the form of a eulogy. Yes, and, and if we are talking about Nehru and Gandhiji, I think we should also talk about Jinnah, because I was reading somewhere that in June 1940, when the Congress President Netaji Bose offered Jinnah the post of the first Prime Minister of Independent India, but he, he there was a contingent on his withdrawing on his demand for the division of India. So can you throw some light on that? Because that's, I think, one of the most uh, interesting part. Shubhash Chandra Bose had good relations with Muhammad Ali Jinnah. And in fact, when as Congress President, uh, he was negotiating with Jinnah and he visited uh, Jinnah at his Malabar Hill residence in, uh, in Bombay, uh, you know, uh, there was a possibility of a breakthrough. Unfortunately, uh, what had happened was that Nehru had said in 1937 after the elections that there were only two parties in India, the British and the Congress. And uh, so, you know, the Muslim League uh, wanted to be recognized as the sole representative organization of the uh, uh, Muslims of India and uh, Jinnah as the sole spokesman. Um, uh, while Shubhash Chandra Bose was pre prepared to go to the extent of saying that we would accept you as the most important re uh, representative organization of the Muslims of India, but the Indian National Congress also has Muslim leaders and Muslim members and so on. So, you know, they weren't able to clinch uh, uh, an uh, understanding. But even after, the Lahore resolution had been passed. And there was no mention of Pakistan or partition in that Lahore resolution, by the way, of March 1940. Uh, yes, uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose did meet Muhammad Ali Jinnah again in June 1940. And he himself has written about it uh, in uh, uh, his book, The Indian Struggle. Uh, and I have quoted from it in the new introduction to my book, His Majesty's Opponent, in the new edition of 2019. Uh, he was, just as he was urging Mahatma Gandhi to lead a new mass movement against the British, uh, he was asking Muhammad Ali Jinnah to get the Muslim League to join the Indian National Congress in putting forward a unified national demand. Uh, and he basically said that if you joined the Congress uh, in this mass movement to win India's freedom, then you will be India's first prime minister. So Shubhash Chandra Bose had said in 1940 to Jinnah what Mahatma Gandhi would say in April 1947. But, uh, you know, Jinnah did not really, was not, uh, you know, forthcoming at, at that point. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, Netaji chose his path to lead an armed struggle for India's independence. But in his movement, if you see, um, you, you know, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Christians, all had an equal role to play. Uh, today I was talking about Abid Hassan, but I've mentioned Mia Akbar Shah, who received him in Peshawar. Abid Hassan, who was in the submarine. 
The first division of the INA was commanded by Muhammad Zaman Kiani. Uh, the uh, Indian tricolor was hoisted in Moirang near Imphal by uh, Shokat Malik. Uh, his companion on his last aeroplane journey was Habibur Rahman. The three red fort, uh, you know, the officers, three officers tried at the red fort were Prem Kumar Saigal, a Hindu, Gurbak Singh Dhilan, a Sikh, and Shanawas Khan, uh, a, a Muslim. Uh, and uh, if you think of who built the INA memorial with their motto, Etmad Ittefaq Qurbani emblazoned on it, uh, it was Cyril John Stracy, a very fine Christian Anglo-Indian officer of the Indian National Army. So everyone uh, was seen equally, they had equal rights, equal status, and that's why he, and, and he, was com he was committed to an equitable sharing out of power among all of the religious and linguistic communities of India. The next question is from Sagnik Sarkar and his question is, how would you comment on Bhagwan Talwar, aka Agent Silver's role in the political mechanism, mechanisms during the INA movement as written by you in your book, His Majesty's Opponent? Yes, um, you know, uh, Bhagat Ram Talwar, was one man who really betrayed Netaji in a very serious way. And uh, this is somewhat unusual because I have met so many of uh, those who were close associates of Netaji and who were utterly devoted to him, fiercely loyal uh, to him. You know, be beginning with my father, he was asked to do a kaj, some work for his uncle, and he couldn't stop doing Netaji's work until the last day of his life. Uh, so I've seen that. I've seen it among all of the INA officers whom I've met as I've been growing up. But Bhagat Ram really played quite a nefarious role. Now, he did help Netaji because Mia Akbar Shah, um, you know, he had, uh, uh, first of all, the person who hosted uh, Netaji in Peshawar was Abad Khan. Mia Akbar Shah had shortlisted two people who would, you know, uh, accompany Netaji in the hitchy hike across the tribal territories and Afghanistan all the way to Kabul. Uh, Bhagat, uh, Muhammad Shah and Bhagat Ram. Bhagat Ram was very keen, so ultimately the role was given to Bhagat Ram. And he did accompany Netaji, and he knew that terrain quite well. Uh, so they were walking, they were, they were, they were riding, uh, they, they were hitchhiking on trucks or tongas and so on. It was a, uh, and, but uh, Bhagatram of course completely failed in terms of uh, uh, making any headway with the Soviet legation. It was Netaji who barged into the German embassy. Later on, it was he who spoke to the Italian uh, ambassador Pietro Quaroni, and that's how they, they were able to get, uh, he was able to get out of Kabul. And he did give um, a manuscript, uh, a letter and a message uh, to Bhagat Ram, which he did deliver to, uh, to my father, Shishir Kumar Bose, and my grandfather, Sharat Chandra Bose in Calcutta by the end of March of 1941. But uh, what happened was that, you know, after June 1941, once the Soviet uh, Union uh, entered the war, the communists decided to shift their interpretation of the war. From an imperialist war, it became a people's war. Uh, and from that point onwards, uh, Bhagat Ram veered towards the communists. But then it's one thing to ideologically support the Soviet Union, but he went much, much, much further. Uh, and uh, he was basically, um, uh, you know, giving information to the, to the British. He was even, uh, you know, once he was arrested, he made a long confessional statement. And then he was sitting in what are the gardens of today's Rashtrapati Bhavan and helping, uh, helping the British. And in fact, even my father's imprisonment, uh, I, I believe was a result, uh, his later imprisonment, he was imprisoned for the Quit India movement, but his later one, 
uh, was because of the betrayal of Bhagat Ram, because Netaji had landed his agents by submarine. There were eight of them, and uh, their leader came to see my father in Calcutta. But there were other groups which went in other directions, one to, uh, to, the, to the Northwest. Uh, and basically, uh, everything that was coming to the Kabul legation of the Germans was being taken by, the, uh, by Bhagat Ram and being handed over to the Communist Party leadership and to the British. And therefore, he did some real damage to the, uh, 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 to the independence movement. Now, the full story of his betrayal didn't come out uh, until uh, the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and there was a Czech historian who first found the, the document. Then I've read it myself in the British archives. Uh, it's, uh, it's rather a sordid story of betrayal uh, of, uh, of Shubhash Chandra Bose. But Shubhash Chandra Bose did not use just that one channel of communication. There were other uh, links that he forged with the revolutionary underground in India. So Bhagat Ram did a lot of damage, but there was also a lot of heroism that we must recognize. I might add that we were, couldn't fully figure out all of this because Mia Akbar Shah, naturally after pa partition, was in Pakistan. And my father tried to bring him to Calcutta, but because of the state of relations between India and Pakistan, he had not succeeded. And then finally, when I was in Cambridge as a fellow, that same year, 1983, when I last met Abid Hassan, my father and, and mother came and I drove them to a place in, called Walsall near Birmingham, uh, where Mia Akbar Shah was visiting his son, Jafar Shah. And Shishir Kumar Bose and Mia Akbar Shah met after more than 40 years and embraced. And then Mia Akbar Shah, gave his full account, which was then published in the Oracle of the Netaji Research Bureau. So also this partition uh, meant that the full scale of uh, Bhagat Ram's betrayal uh, wasn't evident until his confessional statement in the British archives became available in the 1970s. Uh, and we were able to get the full story of what else happened uh, from uh, Miyak Basha and also Abad Khan's family. So we'll take three last questions. And one is from Afzal Khan, and his question is Could you shed some light on the relationship and cooperation between Ras Bihari Bose and Netaji during the colonial India? Were they both following the same ideological path? Okay. Uh, now, Ra Rash Bihari Bose was considerably older. Uh, than Shubhash Chandra Bose, and he had escaped to Japan in 1915. And he and Ananda Mohan Sahai had a good role to play uh, in, in the late teens, the 20s and 30s and uh, so forth in organizing uh, Indians who lived abroad in East and uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, what, uh, what one has to say about uh, Rash Bihari Bose was that uh, he was broad-minded enough to recognize that Shubhash Chandra Bose was really the leader who could galvanize uh, the, uh, the Indian movement in Southeast Asia. And he gracefully transferred the leadership of the Indian independence movement to Shubhash Chandra Bose uh, in, uh, uh, on the 4th of July, 1943, at a meeting in the Cathay Theater in Singapore. In fact, we have uh, film footage at the Netaji Research Bureau of that meeting where he says, you might ask me what I have been in, to been in Tokyo for and what present I have brought for you. I have brought for you this present, Shubhash Chandra Bose. But what I would say is that, you know, Rash Bihari Bose sometimes probably, you know, veered in, in the direction of what we would call away from the clear uh, commitment to secularism that Shubhash Chandra Bose had, uh, if you read some of his sort of letters of the late 1930s, uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose was the one who was absolutely unequivocally committed to, um, to what uh, equality and unity. 
of uh, you know all of the religious communities of India. The next question is from Soumya Roop, and his question is, or her question is, did the idea of government in independent India wholly, wholly same, or there were differences between Netaji's thought and what Nehru and Gandhi thought about the governance of the independent India? Um, look, uh, you know, Gandhiji, of course, uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, believed in decentralization to the point of atomization. Uh, he even said at one point that, you know, the army should be disbanded and so forth. And when Nehru asked him uh, after the end of the Second World War that do you still believe in what you said about, uh, said in Hind Swaraj that, uh, you know, doctors and lawyers and railways and post offices all should go. And we have to learn to uh, you know, live in the huts in villages and not in, you know, mansions in towns and cities and so forth. Ga Gandhiji had replied saying that I don't exactly remember what I wrote such a long time ago, but yes, you know, post offices can stay. But, uh, but what Gandhiji's view was that we must find the real article in India's villages and then the large scale picture will fall into place. That was his philosophy of, of, of governance. Um, Nehru, I think, moved towards a more unitary conception of nationalism uh, and, uh, you know, took power at the helm of a rather centralized post-colonial nation state because he inherited the center of the British Raj. Uh, he could justify that by saying that he believed in socialism and therefore to carry out radical social and econo economic reforms you needed a strong center, even if it were the center created by, uh, the, uh, the, by the British. Uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose, if you read the entire corpus of his works, you know, you will always find, let's say, about three essays where he seems to be saying that you do need a strong center to bring, uh, bring about radical social and economic reforms. But if you read the entire corpus of his works, then you will see that like his political mentor, the Shobandha Chittaranjan Das, he was, you know, committed to uh, the federal idea that Indian unity can really only be of a federal type. And being from Bengal, where, you know, Muslims and Hindus were more or less 50-50 Muslims, a little over 50% of the population in pre-independence Bengal, and Hindus a little less than 50%, he always believed that there had to be equality and there had to be a power sharing arrangement, not just in Bengal, but in India uh, as, uh, as a whole. So I think he would have been more generous than Nehru in you know, trying to uh, reach for a, for a solution that could avert partition. And that's why I feel that, I mean, this is of course a big if of history, that Mahatma Gandhi really missed his rebellious son uh, because his more loyal political lieutenants uh, you know, Jawaharlal Nehru and Vallabh Bhai Patel, despite their political differences on economic matters and so forth, were not really listening to him anymore in 1947. In fact, he was being supported by Jayaprakash Nara and Ram Manohar Lohia, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, but without that strong support from a Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose, he could not preserve the unity of India. So for all their differences, I think, you know, in some ways, Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose occupied a position that is between the extreme decentralization represented by Gandhi and the centralized post-colonial monolith, which eventually, you know, Nehru decided to run. Um, and he, he would have worked out a union from below. Uh, because that was in tune with some of the best political thought of early 20th century South Asia. I think the fitting question to end this beautiful session is from Sarbani Pal. And her question is from your words, we came to know that even to the military people in INA, uh, Netaji Bose was not just a military commander, military general. He was more remembered as a dynamic human being with many qualities, ethics, and moralities. 
and even radical thoughts. But in today's India, we are seeing that with Parakram Devas, he is being reduced only to his militant or mili military identity. Doesn't this particular tag limit his role in the freedom struggle? What is the perception to it, and how should we remember Netaji Bose? He does. Of uh, uh, it does. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there were many attributes uh, to Netaji's character. Uh, of course, he was incomparably brave. Uh, he took enormous risks to fight for India's freedom. And uh, what is very clear is that he never asked his followers uh, to take uh, any risks that he himself would not take. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but it would be such a pity uh, if he were to be misappropriated to a contemporary project of so-called uh, you know, muscular uh, nationalism. Uh, there was a very soft side to his character. Uh, he won people over with profound love. You know, just as Abid Hassan was saying that each one of us, however humble, meant something to him. And he meant everything to us. Uh, I remember, you know, Prem Kumar Saigal telling me, and he's also written about it in the Neta, his Netaji oration and in other speeches that he gave at Netaji Bhavan, that, um, uh, you know, first of all, he, he said that Netaji was a great teacher, that at a, dif at, at a different time, he might have gone down in history as the greatest teacher <laughs> that India could have, because he said that sitting in Mamio, the Burmese hill station, during the war in 1944, he would talk about such a whole range of subjects with the people sort of around him, instill in them, you know, the values that were dear to him. The other thing that I would say is that, um, you know, Prem Saigal was his military secretary at that time, but then when the war took a uh, uh, took, took a turn where he had to go and fight, and he did. He take, took the last stand in Mount Popa. He was sending Prem Sagal to the battlefield. And Prem Sagal told me that there were tears flowing down Shubhashchandra Bose's uh, cheeks, that he was sending Prem Sagal to face real sort of danger. And uh, uh, Prem Sagal says, here I was telling Netaji, Netaji, you know, nothing will happen to me. Uh, I will be all right. I mean, he was, he was so devoted to his followers that the followers were equally, you know, devoted to him. And, uh, and as he wrote in uh, the final chapter of his unfinished autobiography, An Indian Pilgrim, in 1937, uh, My Faith Philosophical, in it, he basically said, that um, that the most fundamental principle in his life that he had accepted was love. That was what sort of de defined him. And therefore, courage, yes, but he was not just a warrior hero. Uh, we must remember him as somebody who, uh, through his profound love, was able to assure completely equal rights and equal status for people who might belong to any religion, any linguistic group, any caste, any gender. So in, you know, two words that I use in Bengal these days is shammo and oikko, samya and uh, unity, equality and unity. And he believed that his political philosophy was that of Samyavada. He, he preferred Samyavada to socialism because for socialism, you would have to say socialism suited to Indian conditions. So he believed in equality between men and women, you know, gender equality equality between Hindu and Muslim and Sikh and Christian, you know, equality among members of all religious communities, equal citizenship, equality among, you know, all linguistic groups 
to, in order to build a federal India, which recognized the cultural autonomy of its different regions, the free life of the regional peoples that could in fact be brought together to build a genuinely united India. Thank you so much, sir, for today's beautiful session. We were almost in a trance when you were speaking and you were transported back to 1941, 1947 uh, in the era of Netaji. It was like living with Netaji for the last one and a half hour that we witnessed. Thank you so much. And we look forward to having you again very soon on Car One. And thank you so much, everybody who joined us live. I think more, more than 80 people joined us on Facebook. Uh, the lecture will be available on YouTube by tomorrow. So do share, do subscribe to Carvan, everybody. And thank you so much, sir. It was truly an honor. Thank you. Carry on the good work. Jai. Thank you so much, sir. Jai Hind.